Okay, today's speaker is Ulrike Kuchner from the University of Nottingham. She did her PhD at the University of Vienna and is now doing her second postdoc at the University of Nottingham. And now she will tell us about her research. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for attending, for joining, for this invitation. Uh, and today I will speak to you about the progress that we're making in our project that is related to galaxy cluster outskirts. Um, we basically want to know how structure in the universe and galaxy clusters in particular evolve and grow over time. And importantly, what impacts this has on the evolution of the galaxies that are accreted into these clusters. As Christoph said, I am a postdoc at the University of Nottingham, where I work with some pretty amazing people. Um, I'm guided by uh, Alfonso Aragon Salamanca, Megan Gray, and Fraser Pierce. You also see a few names here of PhD students, Agustin Rost, Rowan Hager, and Daniel Cornwell. We all work in, in a group um, towards this endeavor. This is all part of the WEAVE and the 300 collaborations. And you see some um, PIs and important names there. Um, so WEAVE is a collaboration that is formed by a team of observers. Um, the, we are preparing for the WEAVE instrument at the William Herschel Telescope. Uh, some, some key figures, uh, you have the names printed there. They all contribute to this work that's related to galaxy clusters and cluster outskirts We're listed here. So Alfonso Aguirre is, is the lead of our WEAVE cluster survey. And then um, Jairo Mendes Abreu and myself are sort of the postdocs preparing for the observations. And you see a bunch of other important names here too. So this side is bringing the observer's perspective to our investigation. And the 300 collaboration is um, a group of theorists and simulators that add this critical simulator's perception to this problem. Um, and especially at this stage in our program where we've, uh, or the WEAVE survey has not quite started yet, this is really crucial. So the team um, around Alexander Kneben and Gustavo Yelpes have really worked hard in the last years to produce a large sample, 324 zoom in simulations of galaxy clusters, and they're constantly being improved. So here you see an example that is already a little older, um, rotating there. Uh, and most of what I show you today is based on this, on the 300. And together in this two-pronged approach, so simulations and observations, we're working um, to answer some of the common questions that we have. And the big one is, how do galaxies assemble into clusters from the cosmic web? And theory tells us that the time a galaxy spends in, in a, a whole range of environments is important, um, but observationally, this is hard to capture and address. And so um, the effect of previous environments, previous to galaxy clusters, on galaxy evolution, that's still unclear. Um, many current and upcoming programs are actually setting out to change this, and that's why we think this important. This work is quite important. We've worked hard to get some kind of higher level understanding of how important this effect of pre-processing might be. So that's the dense environment a galaxy lives in before it is accreted into cluster. Um, we focus on strategies on how we can optimally um, map the infall regions, how we can um, what we expect to find, how we can characterize the filaments um, that are important in funneling galaxies into clusters, and especially uh, looking at uh, the, the added difficulty of um, observed redshift space. And how are we biasing ourselves through observations? So we gave some first answers in these papers that are listed on the side. One, I'm yeah, ready to submit in a few days. So hopefully that will come out soon. Um, and they're printed throughout the presentation. That's an overview of all the topics that we will discuss. Uh, I understand now from having met you that this is quite different to what uh, most of you are working on. Um, so we'll have a pretty in-depth introduction. 
Uh, we will focus on infall regions of galaxy clusters. They are important in the context of galaxy cluster formation and galaxy evolution. Um, these outer volumes of clusters, you know, they're described as the latest frontiers in cluster astrophysics. Um, this is an area where decadal white papers call it the unexplored large volume. Um, there are lots of studies and lots of attention uh, towards observations with X-ray and you know, looking at the intracluster medium in these regions, Sunyash Zedlovich effects, weak lensing, the very challenging measurements because of the low gas density. Um, I or we will focus on um, the galaxy distribution. Um, so we are investigating the evolution of galaxies in different environments. I will detail this as we go along. This is, of course, a multi-wavelength and multi-instrument question. Here, I'm just focusing on weave um, and some synergies with other instruments. We are deep in the process of preparing for this survey. Um, and one of the big questions is how do we deal with the fingers of God? And I will explain that a little bit. We are using the simulations to build mock observations, but they're also very useful for interpreting what we see and, and to just get some senses and understanding and inventory of what we can expect. Um, galaxy cluster outskirts are complex because of the velocity fields um, that we can study that in simulation. So follow the diffuse material and how they move and collapse towards the filaments and towards the cluster. Um, and we've looked at that in a recent paper. So let's start at the very beginning, uh, quite literally. And I am aware that most of you um, are experts in cosmology. So your knowledge is far beyond mine. But even if you aren't, or if you're early career, um, most people have some understanding or some intuition of what um, or how today's large scale structure came to be. Uh, this is a famous simulation that summarizes our understanding and probably enough detail for, for this talk. Um, it's based on 10 billion particles. It's 20 years old now, can you believe it? Um, but you can clearly see under dense in blue um, regions and over dense in red regions. And this dichotomy really is visible at all times, even in the very early universe. But it does change over time. Uh, so the small overdensities grow by gravity, um, and this is a snowball effect, so they attract matter from under dense regions. They will go from the voids um, to the more dense 2D sheets, then travel along these 1D filaments and then come to the knots, that's the galaxy clusters. So you can imagine it's one connected piece, like a sponge with the filaments connecting to the clusters and the voids kind of like tunnels going through this. So just briefly, why filaments? Because that's what I focus on. Um, so why filaments? Uh, they have a simple stability solution. They're pretty amazing, really. They're just based on temperature and density. We see them uh, at all scales, regardless of the environment, regardless of uh, the density. Um, they're present at AU scales, at parsec scales in molecular clouds where they fragment to form stars and these cosmological large filaments that you and I know. Um, but the appearance is very similar anywhere and everywhere. And this is just because the conditions and mechanisms operating everywhere are intrinsically anisotropic. So any process really that reduces dimensions will lead to filaments. If you have an ellipsoidal distribution, anything that compresses things isotropically, it will compress first in one direction to produce these flat pancakey things. And then they will uh, produce some more elongated structures and then you have your filament. Um, but that also means uh, that we tend to form filaments more than any other structure. They're stable, so they survive, uh, but different processes can produce filaments. So you have self-gravity and, and collapse, but also um, turbulence and isotropic shocks as well as magnetic fields can stretch them. And, and so the shape, it might be the same, uh, but the physics that regulate them is, is not. So clearly there's not just one type of filament, um, even though geometrically they look similar. Uh, the type we are concerned with here are these highways that are you know, going into the cluster here. 
Even this kind of cosmological filament comes in a wide range of densities. So this aspect is, I think, really nicely shown by this paper by Marius Kautun, Emrin van der Weigert, and others. They showed that the, the inventory or the, the senses of the cosmic web using a dark matter simulation and the nexus filament finder. And the filaments are shown here in blue dashed, and you can see that it, there is a whole range of densities on the x-axis. Um, from tiny tendrils up to thousand times the density of the universe. So they are multi-scale. You, you, um, you cannot really find them, but just doing a density cut, um, like you might argue for other cosmic web um, um, uh, clusters or, or voids. Um, but even that is not easy. And there was a paper a few years ago by Noam Liebeskind that compared a number of leading filament finders um, and they showed a huge uh, disagreement on, on the different from the different methods. And that doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong. It's just because um, you know, they're looking at different things in the density fields. Uh, it's really interesting actually to investigate because that must mean that different filament finders pick up different effects of, of the filaments or the galaxies in them. Um, so it could be more interesting than a problem that they're sensitive in different uh, physical effects. Um, in the same paper, in the same dark matter simulation and using Nexus, um, filaments are found to make up only a few percent of the volume of the universe here in blue, but they have host about 50% of the mass. And this is similar if you look at, at gas simulations as well. For example, voids, that's that big yellow chunk here, 77% of the volume. It's also a non-negligible fraction of the mass, which um, might be surprising. So you do find halos in them or galaxies in them. They're actually really interesting, low mass things that have not really been environmentally affected. So they are also studied um, in detail by void surveys. Um, looking at surveys, why do we so rarely see walls? That's the green part. Um, it's not that they are not interesting, but they have a lower surface density than average, and the galaxies that lie in them are also lower mass. So they just drop out. We it's harder to see them. Um, so I'm not saying much about walls. Nodes, so that gets the galaxy clusters, that's this tiny chunk here. Um, obviously they host um, a, you know, an, an important fraction for the volume of, of the galaxies in them. These are very massive galaxies, they're older, um, they've you know, formed earlier uh, in them, the high mass, usually red and passive objects that are in the center of the clusters. Uh, so now that we understand filaments and the kind of galaxies that we expect in them, we can look at this overarching question or problem that we want to study. And um, we know that galaxies evolve differently in these different environments. And that's a very simplified statement of a complex problem. This is the one slide summary um, that we have strong empirical evidence that galaxy environment is connected to the properties of the galaxies. And I mean, galaxy color, star formation capabilities, morphologies, dynamics. Um, these properties vary significantly between what you might call the field and the cluster. And here's one example of that, the morphology density relations. So on the left here is the low density regime you might call the field. And you can see that that's dominated by spirals and irregulars here, morphological types. And as you go to more dense regions, so galaxy clusters, this drops sharply and it's sort of replaced by um, ellipticals and lenticular as zero galaxies. Uh, now, we uh, very generally can interpret this in the context of the idea that some external mechanism from the intracluster medium, for example, uh, or from galaxies flying by, um, stop the star formation in galaxies when they enter the cluster, which then changes the whole make makeup of, of galaxies, including the morphology, but um, 
more generally express the star formation. And so in statistically, they look different. But of course, this common approach, just comparing field with cluster, um, treats the environment as static, assumes that the environment in which we observe the galaxies at this epoch is responsible for this transformation. Um, but of course, we've seen that that isn't the case, that we have a whole range of densities in between and different environments, including groups, including filaments. And um, so this assumption that a galaxy falls into a cluster as an isolated system is an oversimplification. According to theoretical prediction, that's not the case, right? That they fall in on their own. Really the past three decades or more have shown us in simulations and also in observations, um, you know, this view of a hierarchical structure formation of the universe, a universe in which galaxy clusters grow in size, in mass, in richness by accretion of isolated, but also of galaxy groups um, and importantly along the filaments. So here are three examples of uh, the 300 uh, just running through. And if I stop relatively low redshift, you can see these filaments coming in. You have the bigger halos uh, coming in and that sort of schematic view on the left side. So in addition to galaxies on their own, you have them coming in on their own in filaments and coming in as groups through filaments. And how these uh, different environments uh, change the stellar and gas properties during the buildup of the structure, that's not fully understood. And that is the, the main topic of, of our investigation. So, so far we don't know if or how filamentary accretion regulates star formation or AGN feedback or um, is the cosmic web feeding the galaxies via cold flows? How about spin you know, accretion history? And there's a lot of research trying to answer this question. So is the cosmic web uh, key in galaxy evolution? Um, there are multiple ways in which the cosmic web could affect the growth of a galaxy. Just because the large scale structure impacts gas flows in a nonlinear way, it can affect the halo growth, the gas secretion. Um, and to answer this, people have used different samples and different ways to define the cosmic web. Um, so it won't surprise you that some people find that galaxies near filaments are red, more massive. They have reduced star formation rates. So all the things we expect from a denser environment. But others find basically the opposite. Um, an H1 enhancement near filaments um, of the cosmic web. So they suggest the cosmic web enhancement. They find that uh, galaxies in filaments are actually more star forming, um, that they assist the gas cooling um, and, and increase the extent of the star formation. And just really briefly in our simulations, we find, and this is work led by Charlotte Welke, that this enhancement only happens inside clusters, so for intracluster filaments, um, where the, the filaments are denser than the background, but not outside of, of um, clusters. So this whole controversy suggests that the, this multi-stream region of the large scale structure does have an effect, a secondary effect. Um, and that galaxies accreted by clusters become affected before they enter the cluster. Um, but maybe differing results is due to the way we define the cosmic web. So maybe different experiments, just having different cosmic web estimators um, get different results. And so how we define filaments seems to matter. And here is a big challenge for our observations that are coming up. So you might, when you think of large scale structure, think of these kind of scales where you can basically draw by hand uh, a filament. But we are looking at these kind of um, uh, extensions. So we have a booming cluster in the center and basically some you know, connecting filaments sticking out um, on the sides. 
uh, tons of foreground and background galaxies, especially at low magnitudes, those background galaxies um, just dominate the total counts. Um, the geometry, the topology is different if you just focus in on the cluster. So if you want to trace and extract the filaments at cosmic web kind of scales, the issues will be different to when you're looking in the neighborhood of clusters. And remember, we are looking at doing this with observations that <laughs> look very different to, um, to simulations. So we didn't know whether we are able to identify filaments in cluster outskirts, outskirts so we had to test it to optimize the filament finders to get ready and have a solid strategy for our observations. So to finish all this introduction, I think we're now maximally prepared for this. Um, I will put together the simulations, uh, so the, the 300 and the observations weave. So the 300 are those 324 zoom in simulations. Each are re-simulated containing the central cluster. And then you have a sphere of 15 megaparsec radius that's roughly matched to what we will probe with weave that will target 20 clusters very nearby. And we uh, cover to at least five times our 200. So all of this work is with weave in mind, but really all the results are um, presented for a range of upcoming surveys. So there's foremost, there's buffalo wings, moons, dizzy, JWST, those things will um, work very similar. So to prepare a strategy and forecast expectations um, with, we use these 300 simulations as a ground truth based on the best case scenario that's um, seen here on the left. Um, <clears throat> we use the gas particles where we think they are the underlying traces of filaments uh, to identify a network, a filament network, and we do this with the filament finder disperse. That's a well-tested filament finder for our uh, purpose now, so used in both simulations and observations. Um, the, the code identifies the topologically significant features in this density field, uh, in the tessellated density field, so you just give it an, in, an input of discrete positions, for example, gas particles or galaxies, you can do this in 3D or 2D, and the final network is then reconstructed as lots of little segments, and that's called a skeleton. Uh, we associate galaxies to these filaments, so that's seen here in the middle, and these are based on what we expect to get with weave, so um, down to 10 to the 9 solar masses, um, or in halo mass, about 10 to the 10. Um, a filament's thickness is, depending on your science case, uh, we detail this in this publication, we find a thickness of about 0.7 or one megaparsec in radius. So that depends on if you're interested in purity or completeness, you know, accuracy or precision. Um, but these are the numbers that we will go with. So basically we then compare filament networks from our reference underlying gas to degrade it with what we think it will be like in weave and, and just compare the two and, and see how well we're doing. We also do this if you have not so deep surveys or L star mass cuts, or if you choose to do a 2D reconstruction versus a 3D. Um, and that's all in that paper. Um, we're doing this to prepare for the spectroscopic survey, WEAVE, the WEAVE White Field Cluster Survey, um, where we will then be able to answer the question of pre-processing with the spectroscopic observations. So again, this is uh, 20 clusters really nearby, 0 0.04, 0 0.07, uh, out of five times um, R200. Uh, the goal is to map this region, see how many are in groups, how many are in filaments, where is this transformation from uh, star forming where is it quenched then it becomes a um, quiescent galaxy? What makes a cluster galaxy? Where does that happen? Um, 
WEAVE is a survey facility. It has three modes. The multi-object spectrograph is what we're using here, uh, but it also has two IFU integral field units. Um, and the multi-object spectrograph has a thousand fibers, uh, about two degree uh, diameter. And we basically cover these clusters that we've selected with many of these pointings, each a thousand fibers, up to 20 pointings, we'll cover them. So we have the whole region, we think we'll get um, you know, 4,000, 5,000 spectra per cluster uh, volume to really um, study the, all the members and also the infalling galaxies. Um, there are multiple other surveys with foremost, with um, there's the Waves Galaxy Evolution Survey, Chances, uh, 4HS Community Proposal. So this is really a topic um, of investigation in galaxy evolution in, in the near future. So currently we're even taking this closer to observations, really configuring all the simulations. So going through the whole OB cycle of our simulated observations, see if, you know, how does the fiber collisions impact filament finding? Um, and we, you know, the, the idea is that we will have good photometric redshift and color and magnitude to have a high confidence of defining the volume beforehand, but then there are these instrumental constraints which we're also looking at at the moment. Just very briefly, the Weave Galaxy Cluster Survey um, has three layers. We, the Weave Whitefield Cluster Survey, that's only one of them. Like I said, we use the multi-object spectrograph. Here's an example of, of the science verification. And you can imagine there's a filament going through here. But there are also, there's a nearby cluster survey that concentrates on dwarf galaxies and puts IFUs on dwarfs. And there is a cosmological cluster survey that looks at the evolution of central cluster galaxies and uh, cosmological constraints from scaling relations. And they use these large IFUs that are also part of WEAVE. So WEAVE is obviously a spectroscopic instrument. And so we do need some synergies uh, with Euclid, uh, for example, which I already detailed a bit in our conversation beforehand. Uh, Euclid will have the capability to get exquisite morphologies and they do cover the whole clusters in, in our survey. Um, so you can see in this figure what is expected of Euclid at point one um, you know, in comparison to SDSS. And we will be at, at about point five. Uh, so I'm a member of this working group um, where we are currently um, looking at which codes are giving us the, the quote unquote best results for, uh, for, for morphology. And there's also some effort to collect H1 data with uh, where we've acts as ancillary. So there is um, a proposal that was accepted to get some uh, meerkat observations. Um, so the, the, the H1 disks or H1 morphologies in the outskirts. And obviously WEAVE will then have the optis, optical spectroscopy that will reveal the evolutionary state of the stellar populations. So you can see a lot is going to happen with observations, um, but a big question is how do we deal with fingers of God? How do we identify the filaments around the clusters given the specific detail which is the redshift space distortion. Uh, so there is this issue of gravitational attraction that causes matter to move. Um, it creates these distortions along the line of sight that you could see in this video from SDSS. Um, and they look like filaments to a filament finder, the stretching and flattening caused by the peculiar motions of the galaxies. Um, and this happens because the galaxies that are clustered together move more rapidly towards and away from the center of the cluster and that spreads uh, them out in redshift. And people have um, just uh, dealt with this by uh, statistically compressing these fingers. So identifying um, groups here done by Katarina Kraljic and then just 
compressing them in these big maps of large scale structures. Uh, this is from the gamma field. Um, another really compelling study by uh, Santiago Bautista on supercluster scales also showed that this was possible if you have a lot of information on, on like big uh, superclusters. So we tried this uh, with our one cluster in the center. Uh, it's narrowing down here on just the cluster. And on the left side, you have this ideal case of just knowledge of 3D, nothing is moving, uh, like we would like to think in a simulation and where it all works well. But if you add these fingers of God, the dispersed software just thinks that's a filament and um, is no longer reliable. So like in the um, work that I just showed you from Katarina Kaljic, um, I identified the virialized regions, so the centers of the cluster, and just compressed them statistically. So made a little ball out of that finger. And the same with galaxy groups. So each of these um, identified and then compress the finger of gods together and see whether that works is good enough to have a reliable filament um, extraction. And unfortunately, not. Um, so the rest of the galaxies are still perturbed in this direction according to redshift space distortion. So that's all the blue points. They're still disturbed because they're still moving around. Um, so the red points are these compressed groups and cluster center, but the, the blue are all the galaxies that are perturbed. They're perturbed up to like 300 kilometers per second. Um, and, and that's a lot. So even if you manage to compress the center and the groups at these scales, um, a filament finder is confused because everything is still moving. Um, so in, in order to understand the underlying reasons for this complication, it does help to look at how matter flows between the different morphological components, so that between the cluster and the filaments and the groups. Um, so the cosmic flows program that really revealed that the local dynamics uh, also in the lower density regions uh, impact the, the inferred density distribution. So, um, that's the input to a filament extraction from observers. And uh, this is due to the dynamics of cluster outskirts. So this plot shows on the x-axis the distance to the filament, which you would have on the left side here. And on the y-axis, the distance to the cluster. Uh, so kind of here, if you imagine, this is a filament connected to a cluster and um, the, you see here the stacked velocity field of the gas that is surrounding the filament. So the, the particles that are inside of halos are actually twice the R200 of a halo is removed. So it's just filament gas and, and uh, gas that is not trapped in halos. Um, and the color coding indicates the velocity. Uh, and that gives a clear signature on how uh, the flows uh, converge to the major filament here on the left side and then progresses down towards the, the cluster. And so undoubtedly clusters are the greatest attractors of the galaxies, but the matter also moves towards the filament and collapses towards filaments. So we can see this collective motion uh, of, of matter from low density regions towards uh, filaments, and then it kind of accelerates um, down to, to the cluster. Um, and that is also called high waves of galaxies or high waves um, of you know, bringing material to the clusters. Um, near the cluster there, we have a little vortex here. So the, the motion of gas, that, um, that's also very different to the dark matter uh, that doesn't have this um, because you know, collisionless. So this is consistent with the, with the observation that gas resists the, the shock in, in the filaments um, and, and we have some, some shock here close to the cluster. Um, that's the whole... Um, movement here and what we see is stronger for massive clusters and for long filaments. Um, 
And, and so this is a really complicated cluster outskirt physics, this turbulent interaction, uh, mixing of material, these thick filaments. Um, <clears throat> but that's also visible in, in the galaxies. So here now is the distance to a filament that's sort of indicated by these lines. So here's a filament. And on the y-axis is the velocity. So you can imagine that galaxies collapse onto the filaments uh, with you know, 200 kilometers per second or so. And that will uh, yeah, create its own little redshift space distortion, its own filament fingers of God. And to relate it back to our problem earlier, this is the reason why it is difficult in three dimensions to uh, identify filaments if you just simply compress um, the virialized regions. Even the, this collapse velocity of the galaxies towards the filaments will complicate um, uh, at these scales, the filament finding. So then how can we trace the filaments um, around the clusters? And one, one option is to find uh, to define the volume really well around the cluster and then just use the 2D um, uh, projection uh, for, for the filament finding. We do have the spectroscopic redshift so we can throw away background galaxies. Um, so this is sort of what we will do. We still identify correctly a high fraction of filament galaxies. So what can we then, if we assume we have correctly identified the filaments, ask? We can ask how many galaxies actually get into clusters through filaments? Um, how does this change or does this depend on the radius of the filament? Does it depend on um, uh, the um, radius away from the cluster? And um, how many galaxies reach the cluster through filaments? That is actually a difficult question because it does depend on how you define the filaments. Yeah? But it also depends on what your mass uh, limit is. So we know that higher mass galaxies are more likely in filaments. So uh, half of all L star galaxies and 60% of even, yeah, more massive galaxies will actually live in filaments and will reach a cluster through filaments. If you go down in mass threshold, so this is three times 10 to the 10 halo masses, you will have a lower uh, fraction of the galaxies. Um, high mass galaxies are likely found in filaments. It does depend on how thick your filament is. So obviously, if you have a narrow filament, then fewer galaxies will make it. This is based on 0.7 megaparsec. How do we define the filament thickness? Um, well, we base this on gas, uh, on, on, on the uh, gas density and this drop off, and we define uh, it at one megaparsec, or if you're a bit more rigorous on 0.7 megaparsec, so this again depends on if you're interested in pure sample or, or uh, include as much as possible, et cetera. It's interesting to see that dark matter filaments are a bit more fluffy than gas filaments. And, and we looked at this in, in a paper led by Augustine Rost. Uh, the answer does not depend on mass or dynamical state. So that was, uh, this line is flat. It does not depend on how massive or relaxed the cluster is, but it does depend on the cluster radius. So here we have the cluster in the center, and this is the distance to the central halo, so the distance to the cluster. And the percentage of galaxies and gas filaments slowly increases as you go closer. In fact, filaments actually become thicker as you get to the clusters. Um, they sweep up more galaxies as you get there. Um, and in fact, we speculate that this increase of, of this bunching up of galaxies closer to the filaments could be because we have a large fraction of um, 
of backsplash galaxies. Thank you. Um, so we've shown that between 30 and 70% of all the galaxies just outside a galaxy cluster are actually galaxies that have gone through the cluster. So they are backsplash galaxies. They have passed the center of the cluster and are now located just outside. So they're all um, in yellow here now. You have this cloud of galaxies that have gone through and out again and are now bunching in as a second time. And that um, complicates the question of pre-processing. And it complicates the question of what kind of galaxies are in filaments, because clearly galaxies are in filaments are heterogeneous. Um, there are groups that are part of filaments. There are backsplash galaxies that are part of filaments and filament filament galaxies. And that's uh, our latest paper that we looked at. So to summarize this here, this inventory, um, we can see that, uh, sorry, that is easier to look here. Uh, we see that, um, you know, if you say maybe 40, 45% of all the galaxies that fall into clusters through filaments, many of them will actually be part of groups and many of them will actually be part of backsplash or actually backsplash galaxies. So they have this um, knowledge of, of the cluster itself. Um, it's challenging to identify backsplash galaxies, usually signatures of, um, of stripping, et cetera, need to be in them, um, but they are distributed just like any others. So we looked at whether maybe they go through the cluster and then want to come back through a filament. No, they go through the cluster and spread out and then leave and come back in, in a large cone that um, just overlaps everywhere. So there is no specific preference of how a backsplash galaxy comes back through um, to a cluster. Um, so if you just look at a filament, so we have a cluster, this is a filament, and we have a stacked histogram now here, you can say that about 12% or so of galaxies that come back into the cluster are in groups or have been in groups for a long time. So they have been processed by a group. So they have been quenched by the group. If you get closer to the cluster, there's this massive population of backsplash galaxies where we know that they have been processed by the cluster. And the rest will be these pristine filament galaxies that have been in the cosmic web and just experienced the filament um, environment. So as a way to sum up the entire thing, um, Clusters agreed up to 45%, that's for one megaparsec of all galaxies via filaments. They themselves are heterogeneous environments that host groups and backsplash galaxies alongside those galaxies that really only have been in the filaments. Um, the exact fraction depends on the dynamical state of the cluster. Um, but uh, it is important to remember that this uh, statistical breakdown, this, this census or inventory of filaments means that a filament galaxy has seen potentially a whole variety of environments, a whole history. Um, some of them of what they carry is uh, historical, like in the backsplash galaxies, and some is the instantaneous environment, like in a group, um, that defines what a galaxy looks like. Um, the complex outskirts of, of, or the complex physics of cluster outskirts really makes reconstructing the environmental history uh, of galaxies quite challenging, um, because it always depends on what, how relaxed the cluster is, um, or on the distance to the cluster center, and as well as the mass. So the measurements will be challenging, but we believe that we are um, maximally prepared for the, for the observations to start um, in a few months time. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention and take any questions if there should be any.
Yeah, thank you very much, Uli. It was a very great, a very great talk. I learned lots of new things about well, how difficult it is to define filaments, and yeah, what's going on there. So now, any questions? Uh, I see uh, David. Oh no, he's applauding. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so if there is no question right now, I will ask one. So you have been doing all those new simulations. Uh, where are exactly the strengths of these simulations compared to pre-existing large hydrodynamic simulations? Mm -hmm. Where are you doing better? Yeah, so let me first stress that I am uh, not the creator of the simulations, but I exploit the simulations. Mm -hmm. Um, here again, uh, a video of them. Um, so I think the biggest strength is in fact the, the size. So in terms of the statistical size. So we have 324 of those most massive galaxy clusters and their environment around it. And that is unique. So uh, you don't have in the very large cosmological simulations this high resolution zoom in of all these galaxy clusters. Um, so the simulation used the Gadget X um, full physics galaxy formation code. It incorporates star formation feedback from supernovae from AGN. It's a mass complete sample. Um, and it does have the, the different um, dynamical states. It does have uh, a variety of alternative galaxy formation codes, so they tested and cross-tested the different codes against each other um, so that the conclusions really are don't change with the underlying model physics. Um, there are three different semi-analytical models that are also used to populate all the galaxies. Now you will notice that I haven't said anything about galaxy properties in my talk. Um, and that is because there, there is further improvement to be made to really trust the low mass galaxies. Um, so I think that um, one strength is the statistical size. And the other is this continuous improvement uh, when it comes to the, the model physics. Okay, thank you. I see that Satatu has a question. Yeah, hi, uh, very nice talk. So uh, I, I may be uh, a little bit sidetracked. So uh, can you go to that dispersed slide where you showed the filament um, uh, finder results maybe or demonstration? Yeah, is it this one here? Yes, so uh, suppose in the rightmost panel, so does mm -hmm. this filament finder uh, finds just one uh, filament or separate filaments? Okay, so uh, the filament finder actually gives you a range of little segments. And so there, there will be hundreds of tiny segments and then you can um, define a filament as say something that goes from one node to a, a divergent point, et cetera. So in this example here, we will see a multitude of filaments, one, two, three, there it splits here, five, six, but it really again goes back to how do you define a filament? But it does not give you one, but this would probably be, uh, yeah. One so here how, how is it done uh, typically? Means is it that, uh, like that whenever uh, there is an intersection, so you count from there to a huh. divergent point? Yeah, it's so usually, like yeah, it's like, um, uh, so the, the, the dispersed filament finder um, identifies maxima in the density field and then connects those along ridges. And if you have a saddle point, which are marked here as well, usually a filament goes from one maximum through a saddle point to another maximum, and you would call that one filament. So here we would have one, and then it goes to another. If it splits, you can call it the next filament. 
Um, so that you can also, if you are uh, the user of Disperse, you can change according to your own science interests. Um, if uh, how smooth you want them to be or how many live different um, uh, tiny filaments you want. I don't think that for our application, it is useful to identify many more. So for example, here, um, this would be one and another one going off here. But if you are, you know, depending on your question, basically, you could call that one or multiple filaments. For us, it's just interesting, all these points, all these galaxies that are connected to filaments. Okay, so individual filaments do not matter much. Means basically, uh, which galaxy and and basically at what position the galaxies are in filament or not. And I, I yeah, that is idea. that is for us because yes. we're interested in the galaxies that are in filaments, not so much in how many are. Although that is, let me no, that was not a snap answer because let me retract that. Uh, the connectivity, that is the number of filaments that are connected to clusters does matter. And that is just the number of filaments that are really reaching the cluster center. So how many are connected here? And that is a pretty well-defined number. Um, so depending on the mass, you usually have three or four filaments that are connected to the cluster. They then split out. And that is um, interesting to look at how this number, the connectivity, um, is growing uh, with time. Basically, if you have two clusters, each with three filaments uh, merging, uh, then you will have an increase of, of this connectivity number. So you will have multiple, maybe six at the beginning, and then the filaments merge as well. So this is an interesting number in terms of um, how clusters grow and actually also in a cosmological context. Uh, okay, Perhaps thank via you. many ways I have now explained. So the interesting bit is how many do connect to the cluster rather than how often do they then split off. Okay, thank you. I see there's a You're question welcome. by Rory. Hi, Ulrike. How's it going? Hi, good to see you. Yeah, Here you. So I was wondering if I could ask you a question. Uh, it's really interesting what you were saying about the kind of finger of God effect, messing up the mm -hmm. connections between the filaments and the cluster, and also the dynamics in the filaments as well. I was wondering, is it quite sensitive to the inclination angle of our line of sight uh, to the filament? Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So let me go back to this here. Yeah. Um, because uh, um, let me get that right. So the it it does depend in terms of if you just use a a projection, I guess, um, of something that is not a directly looking at it, it will also be misunderstood as a filament. Yeah. Is the effect then stronger if the filament stay in our line of sight, but still significant even if the filaments across our line of sight? Can you repeat that? Sorry, is it stronger yeah. if it's I can imagine in our line of sight? Yeah, I can imagine the effect's quite strong if the filaments stay in our line of sight because you've got all the dynamics of the galaxies yeah. moving down the filament as well. Um, but if they're across our line of sight, like on the sky, um, is the effect still quite significant? Do you still sort of have trouble tracing the real filament, even when it's on the sky? Yeah. Um, yes. So there is still an effect, and we did uh, check that in an appendix um, of our paper. Um, so our ultimate conclusion, which was that we will always do better by just really defining the, the volume and then looking at the projection still holds, even if there's a maximally line of sight or maximally across the line of sight. So the difficulty still outweighs the, the, the path that we defined by going 2D projection. I see. And if I've got time, just one last quick question. Um, I was wondering mm -hmm. if you'd investigated kind of alternative ways of measuring the, the distance down our line of sight. Um, 
So for example, uh, in rather than relying just on the redshift, maybe there could be alternative approaches, surface brightness fluctuations or uh, yeah. Holly Fisher. Yeah, we have, kind of so we haven't, because the, the basically the test, the very clear test was to just check what Katrina did here, if we can do that with um, just looking at the, at the clusters. So just looking at our setup. So we haven't, um, but I acknowledge that many other groups, especially um, at Cup Time, there is a group that have looked at other um, ways of doing this. Because we have such a strength with Weave of having so many um, spectroscopic redshift and identifying the volume so well and throwing away all the background, um, we have uh, decided to go with uh, the 2D projection. I see. Thanks very much. Okay, are there any more questions? Maybe from the students or someone else? Well, is, is there something in a chat? Um, oh, yeah, but it was just a question about the recording. Sorry, I, oh, I, see. I sent it by accidentally public. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, then I have uh, yeah one kind of question for this whole process. You tend to define filaments, clusters, and groups and everything. Does it even make sense mm. to put this in hard categories? Wouldn't it be maybe smarter to parameterize it by some number or two numbers? Mm -hmm. um, I think it does make sense. And I went a bit faster over here uh, because the the group environment um, is believed to be really responsible for a lot of this pre-processing. And in fact, the number that people usually get is much, much higher than what we get. So there have been uh, papers that claim that half of all the galaxies that end up in a cluster come from groups. And here is a big problem because the definition of group is uh, not unique. Um, and the way that we define groups here is quite uh, rigorous in the sense that we identify halos with high um, velocity dispersion and then all the galaxies within one R200 around it. So we believe that the galaxies in this group, which is only 12%, not half, but 12% of the whole um, uh, galaxies that will end up in the cluster, really have been part of the group for a long time. So four um, giga years or so, really have enough time to be environmentally pre-processed. And um, group define or definitions of group is, is a constant debate in, I guess, the observational community and is a, a really important part because um, it is a relatively easy thing to look at an, op uh, at, a, um, at an image and define groups, and there are multiple ways of defining groups. Um, so it is still valuable, I think, to add to that conversation just because it is used so much. Now, whether it's useful to call it pre-processing or whether it's something else is, is another topic. But I, I find it important and valuable to, um, to, to make clear what we mean by group. And it's an exceptionally dense environment. And they haven't been in there for a long time. So they must have been affected by it before they reach the cluster. OK, well, thank you. So last chance, any more questions? Okay, if not, we thank the speaker again. It was a really nice talk and yeah, you were very helpful in the question sessions and yeah, I think- Thank you very much everyone. everyone. Happy and yeah. <laughs>